Thank you, all of you. I just want to say I'm going to ask a couple of questions, <coughs> and then we're going to throw it open to the audience for questions. And I know there's a couple of press people, I think, here. Um, and we'll do some questions. We're going to have another half an hour of this. And then afterwards, there is going to be some more opportunity to chat outside. But first, what I'd like to ask you, Prime Minister, from the observation of what I've heard just now in the last half an hour, this is obviously coming in the context of what some call the clash of civilizations. It seems from everything that has been said that this is about, the unspoken subtext is, what do we do about mostly Muslims and Christians hating each other and trying to, uh, uh, trying to put forth their totalitarian ideology, as you just mentioned. So is the point of your foundation to get across those hate lines in faith and then be able to do good works like end malaria and uh, you know educate and, and all the rest of the very vital things, end poverty? Or is it by doing malaria and poverty programs and education that you will try to get through to the bigger theme? Which is it? I think it's both, really, and simultaneously, um, because I think that one of the most important things is to show faith in action and for people to have an interfaith encounter actually through doing something. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the uh, Malaria No More campaign and the campaign to, to um, eradicate malaria is a perfect example of that. And it's also that I think one thing that's, that's really important about this as well is that, first of all, this isn't just a problem within Islam, sometimes people think of this as if the extremism issue is, is and obviously there, there are reasons why that is so, but it's simply located within Islam and all the issues that we know associated with that. Actually, within each of the major religions, and this would include Hinduism and Buddhism and Sikhism as well, in each of the major religions, I think there are two dangers. One is that extremists um, capture the, religi the religious faith and take it in an exclusionary direction. And the other is, and, and as Eva was saying so brilliantly, you, you know, a totalitarian view as opposed to a pluralist view. And the other is that people say, religion, well, you know, and this is particularly so, I think you can see this in Christianity, well, it's nice to see the buildings and the history and all the rest of it, but it's got nothing to say to the contemporary human condition. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think, therefore, what is important is at the same time as we're doing things that show faith in action, we also understand better about the other and their faith. And, you know, the, the areas of ignorance here are enormous. I mean, I think for a lot of Christians, they're very surprised to be told that within the religion of Islam, Jesus is revered as a prophet. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, are su people are surprised. They don't think that that, that is naturally the case. And you know, when you look round the world today and you see this danger of religious faith, you know, becoming a source of conflict, I think one of the really interesting things is too many of the clear calls to action are from the extreme end of the spectrum. And what we really want to, to do is to say, no, there is a, a clarity and a strength um, and a dedication that is there for people who want to reach out to the so other. So are you also saying that you are trying to win this war of ideas that we've been talking about for the last seven years, since 9-11 at least, and that so far the extremists seem to have won? I think it's important to define what the battle of ideas is. And this is the point. Some people want to define the battle of ideas as a battle between religious faiths. I think the battle is between those of whatever faith who are open to the other, respect the difference, and those who want to use that difference as a source of conflict and exclusion. I mean, I think that's why I think the way Ibu put it is absolutely right, the pluralists versus the totalitarians. And that, I think, is really important to do. And it's important particularly if you also believe, as, as, as I do, that religious faith has something to say about the modern world and about the 21st century. Because that's one of the things that I think is, is, is really important. I mean, I, I personally think the world opening up 
and globalization is basically a good thing. But I also think its danger is that it comes value free, mm -hmm. right? And I think that therefore, if religious faith becomes part of progress in the future, then it can make a real difference also to how people live their lives in a in, in the broader sense. So let me ask you, Salima, mm -hmm. then, very practically, mm -hmm. how does religion and the interfaith experience cure malaria? Well, here's the thing. The, the faith-based communities are doing it now. We, we, there have been, and in many cases, faith-based communities have been the only ones in the developing world, um, in places where no one else would go, working on all sorts of poverty issues. So we know that there have been um, many efforts in, in the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities, specifically around malaria throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and also throughout Southeast Asia. So what we're talking about now is ramping up those efforts. In, in many developing nations where there's no hospital, there's no infrastructure, there's no health clinic, there is a mosque or a church, and those people, or a house, another house of uh, worship, and those people already know what their community and their village looks like. So what happens then when pragmatism, let's say the very necessary you know, work of trying to save lives, is there a danger that sometimes this pragmatism collides with religious doctrine and there's a, an inability to work through that? There, there's always that danger, but what we found so far is that the vast majority of small, singular, unique religious communities throughout the developing world want their folks to live and to thrive. So they get behind efforts that they think um, will be a benefit to their folks. So maybe people were only coming for church on Sunday, and if you come and say, listen, we'll give you bed nets, can you distribute them to the people who need them? They say, of course, train us how to do this. This is what we want to do. And mosques say the same thing. So there, there's always that danger, but particularly with faith-based communities, you're, you're, you're more likely to have success. Let me ask you, Ibu, then, just to follow on what Salima just said. As you know, in the past, there, ha there have been, as, as, as Salima has said, many religious-based NGOs, organizations, churches, mosques, synagogues, and all other religions have uh, done their share of aid and charity work. But there's also been uh, conditions and strings attached. I myself witnessed, for instance, in, in Bosnia, when the world was not helping Bosnia and people were dying and being slaughtered, in came the Saudis and the other Muslims around the world, and they basically gave money, gave relief, but the cost and the quid pro quo was you build the mosques, you adopt our Wahhabi uh, traditions, and uh, you, know, you move your culture away from what it was, in fact, to what our slightly more restrictive culture is. In the same way, governments in this country at various administrations have had a Christian uh, flavor to some of the charity work that's been done, which in AIDS prevention in Africa, for instance, has involved, um, and, and around the world, has involved not giving that help if there's a family planning element, et cetera, et cetera. So there are strings attached to religious help in the very areas that you're talking about. How do you, is that appropriate? And how do you work beyond that? I think a huge part of the, the notion of the Tony Blair Faith Foundation is you, we have to extrapolate from the positive examples of religion in the world and interfaith cooperation. So for every example of strings attached, as you say, or some kind of uh, a narrow and dominating religious ideology in the world, there are wonderful examples of interfaith cooperation and religion enriching the world. And in my view, what, what Salima is saying and what Prime Minister Blair is saying are the two dimensions of what we're trying to do, which is there is a highly pragmatic dimension to this, and there is also a theoretical dimension. And if we're only doing the pragmatic piece, we're not doing full justice to this. We have to have a foot in the Harlem of life and a foot in the heavens of theology. And here's what I mean by that. When, and I'm going to use the example again of Rabbi Heschel and Martin Luther King Jr. When Rabbi Heschel was marching in Selma with Martin Luther King Jr., he said, I felt like my legs were praying. So something very practical, a civil rights march, right, in the Harlem of life. But something also theological, that my action was sacred. And that's what I think this is about. And so I think that extrapolating from, from a handful of negative examples is, uh, is, is a misconstruction of the possibility of this. I think that there are thousands and thousands of positive examples of faith in the world and interfaith cooperation in the world. And I'll just, I'll, f I'll finish with one more, which is I had the blessing of seeing 
Nelson Mandela speak in 1999 in Cape Town, South Africa, the doorstep of the new millennium. And he opened his talk in Cape Town by saying, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for religious communities working together to free South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's the example we're taking from. Not, not the example of, a, of dominating how? theologies Just in the Just tell world. me how. I well, think first everybody of all, here thoroughly believes first in this, of all, by the practicality of it. By telling that story, okay? So, so by saying we are a part of this story, not that story, this story. The second thing is by recognizing, as, as Salima does, that faith communities are sources of enormous social capital. That's just a fact. So in the United States, when over 50% of young people who regularly volunteer say they got their start in a faith community. The fact that the vast majority of NGOs who started development work in Africa were faith-based. Now the challenge of our times is can we bridge that social capital? And can we multiply that social capital? And in, in, in the Interfaith Youth Corps, we see this in a very, very practical way. The vast majority of our work is done on college campuses or in communities with young people. And what we find is that each of these different youth groups, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, etc., they all have a social action chair. And that social action chair, once a semester, is organizing a volunteer project. And what we do at the Interfaith Youth Corps is walk in and simply say, if each of you has a social action chair that's organizing a Muslim volunteer project, and all of you are talking about interdependence and cooperation, and all of you are talking about the values of mercy and compassion, why aren't you doing this together? Mm -hmm. And what we discovered is we needed to put together training programs and curriculum to facilitate that, which is precisely what we've done on six continents all over the world. What the opportunity of the Tony Blair Faith Foundation provides in partnerships with Yale and Malaria No More is just a dramatic scaling of that with a focus on malaria. So, so here's what I see very briefly. Just like in the 1960s, people would wake up and say, I cannot call myself a Christian unless I am committed to civil rights. My religious identity is inextricably linked with freedom, with this freedom, right? In the early 21st century, with this partnership, young people are gonna wake up in the morning and say, I cannot call myself a Muslim if I am not attempting to protect the preciousness of life which is given to us by God against the most egregious murderer of the time, which is malaria. And the reason it's egregious is because it's, enti it's entirely preventable. And I understand that God gave his breath, not just to Muslims, but to everybody. And I understand that it's not just my tradition that calls me to apply mercy, it's all traditions. So what am I doing if I am not coming together with people from different backgrounds to protect the dignity of life? That's what I want the consciousness of the 21st century to be. May I ask um, the distinguished uh, president of Yale and also you, Skip, it's, um, well it's very motivating and it's very motivational and there's clearly uh, an immense amount of grassroots act action in the United States right now, um, whether it be Darfur, whether it be disease, whatever it might be, I think there's a lot of on-campus uh, activism that hasn't existed for a while. How do you harness that so that it's not just a savedarfur.org and it gets to practical um, practical applications. And as you think beyond malaria, which is an enormous goal, an enormous target, you know, some of the big global challenges for us, as you mentioned yourself, is the huge disparity between rich and poor, the huge number of poor people who live in this rich world, and also nuclear proliferation and other such massive challenges. Is this something that the foundation and education can also tackle? I mean, can you tackle nuclear proliferation, for instance, with an interfaith outlook? First you, and then I'll come to you. Well, um, but I think the answer is uh, yes, one can tackle the, b the big issues of social consequence. And I, I would like to make a connection between the kind of on the ground activism that uh, Salima and and um, and Ibu are, th are talking about, and and um, and the sort of the broader consequences. Let's take the example of Martin Luther King. He mobilized many people. He brought people together. He inspired. He created a social movement, if you will. But the the ultimate fruits of that social movement did actually require moving political actors. The ultimate victory mm -hmm. came by changing the laws of the United States by the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and subsequent uh, court decisions over the years. Um, in, in this domain, you mentioned, you talked about 
um, exclusionary tendencies and gave as an example the constraints on reproductive rights that are strings attached to humanitarian aid provided by the United States government. Mm -hmm. This is not provided by the church. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is something our government is doing. How do, we, how, do we, how do we change the political climate so that our governments, ours as well as theirs, if you will, are, are actually um, not acting in an, in, to reinforce these negative religious stereotypes and these exclusionary views, um, but rather, and, and these doctrinaire views, and rather are allowing the embrace of global values and humanitarianism. I think, I think that uh, you know, it's the kind of leverage from the individual action of this uh, and, 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 and the sort of goodwill of the young people coming together to do this inspirational work uh, that, that needs to be translated up into the political sphere and actually manifested in, in creating in all the nations of the world more, more religious tolerance, more appreciation of the diversity of religious cultures, and more recognition that religious faith can be harnessed for good. I hope that's one of the things that our program at Yale will help to comprehend better and promulgate. We've got about 15 minutes left, and I do want to ask uh, people in the audience who've come here to ask their questions. Do you want to talk about nuclear proliferation, or is it not relevant? Well, I got <laughs> are, you trying to, are you trying to hustle me on? Or <laughs> no, I want to know whether the big practical um, issues of today that everybody's talking yeah, about of course. can be uh, approached in, in the way you're suggesting. Look, the, the important thing I is that um, what we're trying to achieve can provide a context within which issues can better and more easily be resolved. And the single thing that would be most dangerous, if we think about it, is a situation where religions and religious faiths were in conflict with each other, and you put the nuclear question you know, into the equation, right? And that's not a completely impossible hypothesis. So, um, you know, yes, of course, it, 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 it matters it, it, it matters dramatically, and it matters also because for, for people um, within the individual face, if they are able better to understand what the other faith is about, I think it does two things. And it's very interesting to me out in the, in the Middle East where I spend a lot of my time, how much interest there is in, in what we're trying to do in this foundation and in the whole interfaith enterprise. And, um, you know, there's a lot of initiatives starting to take shape there. Why is it? Because they recognize out there that people who want the Middle East to engage with the world and be comfortable with the world, that when they have an interfaith interaction, it does two things. It produces greater knowledge about the other faith, but it also says the very fact of this interaction shows we're not in conflict with each other because we're interacting with each other. And so it has a, actually a profound and benign consequence on the cultural attitude and the context within which the politics occurs. And that's why I think you know, this is such a, a, an important question because one of the things that, that really quite frightens me sometimes when I'm out in the region and people say to me, um, Oh, you know, these are political issues. It's got nothing to do with religion. And I say to them, well, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the people that we're talking about say it is to do with religion. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's not, you might want it not to be, but it is. <laughs> and so if we don't have this conversation and get to grips with these issues, we're sort of, you, you know, we're, we're not living in the real space, actually, where, where these things are being decided and debated and determined. So as, that's why I think this is so important. And I know it's, it's, it's kind of odd thing because uh, to be absolutely frank about it, you know, when, when I first started thinking about this and talking about this, you know, you, you can always get the real opinion from your friends. And they're sort of, hmm, <laughs> why, are you, why are you interested in this? And the more I've actually spent time out in the Middle East but in different parts of the world, the more absolutely convinced I've been that this is an important part of working out the future. Thank you very much. I can't resist being really cheeky. You remember when uh, Alistair Campbell said, we don't do God? I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside campaign joke, obviously. Um, okay, let's have some questions from the audience. Should we have Harry Evans? 
<laughs> Are you the moderator, yeah, Harry, or am I? I, I my, name is, uh, my name is Harold Evans. Uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in this because of my experience as an editor uh, when Northern Ireland was flaring up. And it's very similar indeed to the situation in Iraq. The Shiites and the Sunnis are very similar to the Catholics and the Loyalists in Belfast. In my time as an editor, we're killing each other. Um, Tony Blair, with the help of President Clinton and many other people, uh, made a great and brilliant effort to get what now looks like peace in Northern Ireland. How did you uh, relate the faith, since they hated each other like hell, to the political action? What was the nexus there which is going to determine the kind of initiatives you're now going to take? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harry. I, well, actually, it, bringing the, the, the churches together in this instant w was, a, was a significant part of the whole thing. And again, we had the same debate. You know, people would say, it's nothing to do with religion. <laughs> and you'd say, well, excuse me, but... <laughs> They're killing these because they're of a different um, part of the Christian faith, and therefore it obviously is. And actually, one of the things that, that happened was that the Catholic and the Protestant churches started to come together and to talk. And, you know, through that, there was a, an extremely helpful context created. Now, there were lots of politics that had to be got right as well, but getting getting the religious leaders to stand up and, in a sense, stand out for uh, cooperation made a, a, a major difference. Um, and, I mean, I learned a lot from that experience. Um, well, I'll go to that later. <laughs> Quickly, huh? Real quick. Susan Johnson Cook, Women in Ministry International and Faith Advisor to President Clinton. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, historically, most of the leaders of the major religions have been men, but you have the first generation of now women who have two and three decades of leadership in the churches. So we thank you for the invitation, but as you go into the countries that are affected, many are women and children, and we hope that you will have women clergy at the table with you, not just in the audience, because that's an important um, experience that you need to have. Thank, Thank you. you. S can you address that at all? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm Muslim, so <laughs> don't complain if you're Christian. <laughs> 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 we're, 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 we're in the process, of, and this is really, <laughs> 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 this is the time for Muslim women. I mean, there's a, there's a way that right now Muslim women at a global level in, in, in all over the world really have voice and have a platform that we really haven't had for centuries. And it was so heartening for me to see women at the table in Mali. And they were there because they you know, were mothers and had children, but they were also there because they were leaders of communities and they were concerned about the, the, the entire country of women. So I, I echo your point, we're, we're, we welcome is, uh, the Islamic Society of North America, which is the largest membership organization, Muslim membership organization in this country. The president is a woman, Dr. Ingrid Madsen, who is here, along with uh, the East Zone representative, Aisha El Adawiya. So I I hear you, I echo you, you're my sister in this. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, can I ask you, Ibu, in your interfaith work, not just in the United States, but around, I mean, to follow on on this, is that perhaps the sort of little secret that one should try to, to do this Absolutely. through women because yeah. it's less threatening and more yeah. natural? We're figuring Sorry. out how to try to hire some men at my organization. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> of 25 staff, I think 22 are women. Yeah. And of 80% of the participants and leaders in our programs, probably women. Yeah. I think that there's a reason for that. Yeah. And it, the, because the methodology of our work is social action. We don't, we don't adopt the existing structures of religious communities and say, we want all the leaders to show up, which is the methodology of a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of interfaith mm -hmm. work. We say, we want the people who want to act on the shared values of different faiths, which is precisely the kind of DNA of, of the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Okay, I want to go over here, because I, okay, yes, madam. Uh, good morning, I'm Georgette Bennett, and I'm president of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. And I'd like to piggyback on to a comment that Prime Minister Blair made with reference to the necessity of involving religious leaders in the political processes that bring peace. Uh, we have a program called Peacemakers in Action in which we work with religiously motivated individuals on the ground intervening in areas of armed conflict. And 
as we all know, religious leaders generally are completely marginalized in terms of track one diplomacy. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about how to engage them further in track two diplomacy, because it's the track two that makes track one work. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's actually a very uh, good point, because I, I mean, in, in a specific role um, as, as Middle East envoy, if you take an issue like Jerusalem, which obviously is hugely um, uh, difficult and challenging within the context of the, the Middle East peace process, actually the, the, the three Abrahamic faiths have come together and issued statements about it and are trying to work out some common positions on Jerusalem, which I think is actually really Im important. Because again, um, you know, it's sort of bizarre to say the issue has got nothing to do with the religion. I mean, obviously there's a political negotiation, but <laughs> it's plainly got something to do with religion as, and religious faith as well. And I think there's, you know, there's a, also a lot of the conflicts in different parts of the world. I think it's important to emphasize constantly that although this tends to be a conversation about Abrahamic faiths, but actually, if you look at Hindu-Muslim relations, um, if you look at some aspects of Buddhism, particularly today, there's issues there. And religious leadership can really help that political process. There's one other thing that I think is really important, though, which I think, in a way, the foundation can help with. Um, and that is also getting the religious leaders to be prepared to stand up and to advocate peaceful coexistence. You know, it's, it's a, I mean, one, one of the things that's, that's exciting about starting this foundation is we've got a lot of support from different religious leaders. I mean, I think people like Rick Warren, for example, um, who've done an immense amount of work um, in Africa and elsewhere, um, but people of different uh, religious faiths, you know, these are, leaders that are prepared to stand up and say, we actually want to use our faith as a source of reconciliation and peace, but we need that to happen as well. Because sometimes, and actually, I think this was not true of my experience in Northern Ireland, but if you go back in time in Northern Ireland, it was true. Sometimes the religious leaders are reluctant to come mm -hmm. and, and really be measured up mm -hmm. <laughs> to the, the scale of the challenge. And, you know, where there is this religious aspect to a political issue, it's important they exercise that leadership too. It's a bit of a courage deficit sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, there is sometimes. On the other hand, as we've seen from examples that uh, Ibu has just been giving now, the, the opposite is also true. And you mentioned uh, Wick, Rick Warren here. And, you know, during God's Warriors, we uh, interviewed a number of American evangelical leaders who've had such a important uh, impact on the political process and some of them were very clear about what it meant to be a Christian today in terms of trying to tackle these issues global poverty injustice and even climate change and global warming and one of the persons that I was speaking to um, he basically said it's very difficult to get this huge global humanitarian cause discussed within the evangelical community, but the way he's been able to do it is by calling it creation care and therefore making it a religious doctrinal imperative. Whereas, yeah, whereas um, others on the more extreme side of the evangelical community were focusing mostly just on the social religious issues, gay marriage, um, uh, you know, all the other things, uh, women's right to choose, etc. And he was saying, actually, our community, we should start taking these big issues and make them a religious imperative. Um, we've got time for one more question. I'm going to go to you, madam. Hello, I'm Deborah Moldau from the United Religions Initiative, and thank you all for this just outstanding and important initiative. We're all very grateful. Uh, I'd like to know what plans, if any, the Foundation may have to work with the United Nations. Um, very much on the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. I mean, that's really wh where we want to get the right partnership between the faith organizations to help meet those, and the malaria uh, eradication obviously is one of those goals. But I think also, um, uh, I've actually talked about this with the UN Secretary General, I think 
The United Nations also has an interest in promoting the more general approach of, of interfaith understanding. Um, and, you know, I think what is interesting is the appetite out there on this issue is far greater than people really, really understand. I mean, I, I should thank uh, Jeff and Time Magazine for, for, for actually giving us the opportunity. I think for some aspects of, um, you know, the way the media wor world operates today, people kind of write, is this a religious issue or a political issue? Which correspondent do we kind of send, <laughs> you know, where does it fit in? I think we're at the beginning, though, is something that I think people who are interested in the world as a global community, and obviously that is where the United Nations come in, are starting to understand the importance of this, the enormous liberating effect of proper understanding and the very dangerous potential of misunderstanding. And so, I, I mean, I, as I say, I feel myself that this is... Um, I feel a sense of mission and urgency about this that, that, that I think and hope reflects something that is out there in the real world. Thank you very much indeed. We, we could go on obviously because it's such a fundamental issue and you're really taking the bull by the horns. We look forward to continuing to cover it. And uh, there's going to be um, more reception outside. Prime Minister Blair is going to stay for a little bit and let's uh, adjourn. Thank you very much and thank you Jeff. <laughs>